In Mesopotamian mythology, the moon god was considered to be a protective deity, a guardian, if you will, of his followers, particularly those in the region of Ur, where his great temples and cult centre resided. His reach and significance span drastically across the Mesopotamian pantheon, and he was frequently listed alongside the likes of Anu, Enki, his father Enlil, and his daughter Inanna. Across the regions of Akkadia, Babylonia, and Sumeria, Nana was known by several different names, including Nana, Nana Swain, and Sin, or as the Illuminator. Amongst these territories, he would maintain the position as Moon God, and was often dubbed as a God of Wisdom. There was also the epithet Enzu, the Lord of Wisdom, which was also associated with Nana. It's understood that like the aforementioned gods, he was one of the oldest and appears to be mentioned in ancient writings that span as far back as the year 3500 before the Common Era. In fact, by the third period in the city of Ur, somewhere between the third and second century before the Common Era, there were many hymns and inscriptions written of him, thus confirming his status as a chief god of the Pantheon. Of course, his highly reputable status comes as no surprise when you consider his father Enlil, he who was celebrated for many years in Mesopotamia as the god of all gods. We first see mention of Nana's parents in the Sumerian myth Enlil and Ninlil, which describes the seduction of his mother Ninlil, and how she gives birth to several sons including Nurgul, Ninurta, and Enbilalu. But of these sons, it is Nana who was considered to be the most important, likely on the account that he was the firstborn. Whilst on the subject of family, we understand that Nana's wife, the goddess of reeds, Ningal, also gave birth to his more famous children, Inanna, the goddess of love and war, Ereshkigal, the goddess of the underworld, and Utu, the god of the sun. Historians have suggested that some practical thought had gone into the belief that Nana was Utu's father, and proposed that because the moon was important to travellers who moved by night, it helped them determine which month it was. This was believed to have been Nana guiding people throughout the wilderness, and granting them a sense of bearing. Of course, once travellers were settled within a community, they no longer needed the moon god for this purpose, and thus, the sun became a far more important essence in the growing of crops. Therefore, transition from the wilderness to society saw Utu become a more recognised deity as the sun god, and so, some might say that a parallel can be drawn between man finding a home and the birth of Utu. In some traditions, we also see Ishka featured amongst his descendants, sometimes known as Adad who was the god of storms. In the ancient times, Nana's primary symbol was considered to be a bull, or the horn of a bull, which when rotated, made the shape of a crescent moon. But his link to bulls, or cows for that matter, does not end here, for we know from the text, A Cow of Sin, a magical medical text, speaks of the story of Nana's magical cow, Gemsin, the cow was described as being pregnant, and was enduring tremendous pain during pregnancy, but Nana, or Sin, is seen to erase the cow's discomfort. The text implies that Sin also had the ability to remove the pain a human woman might face during her pregnancy, which leads to the idea that amongst his duties pertaining to wisdom, Sin was also a fertility god, by easing the pangs and woes of childbirth. This would also correlate with the realm of his daughter Inanna, who was also named as a fertility goddess. One might also say that given the moon is connected to the menstrual cycle in some cultures, Sin or Nana certainly have some influence over reproduction, menstruation and bodily health. This is much unlike Utu, who is physically seen charioteering the sun across the sky 
in some of the mythological tales. Nana, on the other hand, does not seem to physically move the moon, or dictate its course across the sky. Whilst depictions of Nana are quite rare, he was thought to have maintained a beard of lapis lazuli, a deep blue metamorphic rock, and would ride on a winged bull, or sometimes a beast, that was part lion and part dragon. In some astral theological systems, he is represented by the number 30, and as you might imagine, is consolidated with the moon, with the average number of days in a lunar month equaling 30. He was also thought to have been seen riding the night sky, similarly to his son Utu. Though where Utu could be found in a chariot, Nana was found in a barge or a small boat. As mentioned, the Sumerian city-state of Ur was the cult centre for Nana, and also where his main temple was situated, that which was known as Ekishnagal, or the House of the Great Light. It was at this temple in Ur where the role of the Arn priestesses was established, that which was a role conducted by the daughter of the Akkadian king in power, most notably by the daughter of Sargon the Great, the princess Enhedwana, who was recognised as maintaining this role. In fact, on the topic of Sargon the Great, it would become apparent that the king revered Nana, or Sin, with the utmost diligence, and the moon god's wisdom was honoured by not just him, but also his descendants. In fact, his grandson would even adopt the name Naram Sin, in honour of the moon god, before ascending to the throne, showing that the kings of Akkadia, at some point, owed much of their glory to this very deity. Given how highly the Akkadian royalty thought of Sin, it's probable that the god was regarded as the head of the pantheon, or the father of gods during this time, where the region of Ur held dominion over the Euphrates Valley in the years 2600 to 2400 before the Common Era. Naturally, the consolidation of the Akkadian Empire did not begin until the year 2300 before the Common Era, so it's interesting to note that it was Sin, a god that is much less remembered when compared to the likes of Enlil and Enki, that spurred on the conquests that saw the Akkadians become the first rulers of Mesopotamia. As the more devoted worshippers of the moon god, the Akkadians also knew Sin by a few other names, including Asimbaba, meaning the embellisher, and Nam Rasid, meaning he who shines forth. Sanctuaries in the Sumerian city-state of Nippur also shared the same name, and were used as places of worship for the moon god. But there were said to be many of these temples throughout both Akkadian and Babylonian regions. Another more famous temple that was dedicated to him was situated at Haran in modern-day Syria. Whilst the Akkadians revered Nana, or Sin, as the chief of the gods, the Babylonians would come to view him with some differences. To them, Nana was the son of the usurper god Marduk, who, with the decline of Enlil, would assume his position as head of the pantheon. It was believed by the Babylonians that Marduk had created Nana with the intention of placing him in the sky to serve as the moon. Additionally, eclipses were worked into a narrative, whereby demons had descended upon Nana in an effort to steal his moonlight. With his father Marduk, Nana would do battle with the demons in the sky, and upon victory, natural light would be restored. Additionally, there are other ideas that upon lunar eclipses, Nana would descend into the underworld, where like his son Utu, he would serve as a judge for the deceased. It's understood that Nana's wife Ningal may also have served alongside him in his duties in the underworld, though this is just speculation based on a set of artifacts known as the Eyes of Ningal, which are specially crafted clay eye models infused with semi-precious stones. The use of these eyes in the age of Mesopotamia is very much unclear, though one might suggest it represented the eyes of the gods, the eyes of Ningal specifically, who along with her husband 
were always watching the mortals, and thus were in a reliable position to judge a person with the utmost accuracy. As far as the mythology goes, Nana or Sin are spoken of in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where he is noted as being the father of both Inanna and Utu, or Ishtar and Shamash. We even see Gilgamesh compose a song for Nana, where he praises the god for the series of events in his life, as well as the opportunities the god has provided for him to grow. It's also supposed that Gilgamesh praises Nana as Nana was able to see his future, and thus guided Gilgamesh through various points of his story in order to ensure he achieved the best possible outcomes. With this, it is also believed that Nana was something of a divinity god, a god who could understand exactly where man was heading, both as a species and individually, and therefore could be appeased to in order to garner wisdom for future events. Meanwhile, in the poem The Journey of Nana to Nippur, we see more of the relationship unfold between him and his father Enlil. In this poem, we see Nana loading his boat at his patron city of Ur as he prepares to visit his father at Nippur. He fills his boat with several gifts to present to his father, including trees, plants and animals, and proceeds across the sky taking moments to stop at several cities along the way to pay respects to the other gods. When he gets to Nippur, he and Enlil feast for a great many days. Afterwards, Nana asks his father for a favour. He asks for the river to be filled with sweet water, for the fields to produce a healthy harvest, for honey, wine and a long life for which to enjoy them. Enlil grants his son this favour, and Nana returns to Ur. It is believed that this poem reflects Nana's association with fertility, and that by dealing with Enlil, the god of all gods, and thus the one with enough power to grant anything, Nana achieves an environment for the humans in which they can thrive. He is able to bargain not just for clean water and an abundant harvest, for which was necessary for human life, but also honey and wine, commodities if you will, that would give the humans a sense of luxury. He not only seeks to ensure humanity's survival, but also seeks to ensure that they enjoy life and live long enough to feel content. It might also be said that Nana was a god of giving, a god of gifts even, who cared deeply for humanity and provided for them in abundance. It is therefore not surprising to find Nana in the position to determine the fate of humanity, on the account that he not only knows their future, but also is responsible for them in some capacity, for it is by his hand that they enjoy certain comforts such as alcohol. As a judge in the underworld, it would have been quite fitting, and perhaps comforting for the Mesopotamians to have Nana decreeing their fate, for the god certainly had a liking for humanity and would have wanted the best outcome for each individual man. Yet if Nana determined someone to suffer, there could be no doubt that the person deserved it, especially considering how like Enki worked against Enlil to save humanity in the flood, Nana also goes the extra mile for them too. Like with many of the gods from this era, we understand the scope of which Nana was incorporated into the Akkadian Empire and how the god transcended civilizations by making his way into the Assyrian Empire over a thousand years later. But when the Assyrian Empire collapsed, many of the deities lost their imperativeness. Nana however survived and was worshipped in what is now modern day Syria and as recent as the 3rd century of the Common Era. Let me know what you thought about Nana in the comments below and as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode on Mesopotamian mythology, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.